Volume One, Chapter One of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter One. Mrs. Willoughby was, at the age of thirty, left a widow, with a son and a daughter, of whom she was extremely fond, and to whose education she entirely devoted herself. George Willoughby, her son, had been placed at Eton by his father, but attended by a private tutor, a man of sense and learning, who was distantly related to their family. When he was about thirteen, a fever, from which he narrowly escaped, so injured his constitution that his mother was directed by his physicians to take him to the south of Europe. Thither she and her daughter, with Mr. Everett, accompanied him. A few months completely restored his health, and they then went all together to Geneva, where, after a short residence, she left her son to pursue his studies under the care of Mr. Everard, and with her daughter Matilda, then near eight years old, she fixed herself for some time at Heres, on the coast of Provence, a town whose beauty she had been much struck for four or five years before, when, to divert her concern for the loss of her husband, she had made a tour of some months through France and Italy. Matilda was placed in a convent for the purposes of instruction, and there she became the playfellow of a little girl almost three years younger, who was known among the nuns by the name of La Petite Celestine. The fondness which soon subsisted between her and Matilda introduced her, of course, to Mrs. Willoughby, who was at first sight charmed with her beauty, and after a few interviews, so delighted with her infantine caresses, that she became as anxious to see her every day as she was to see her own child. Her countenance, with that blooming delicacy with the French distinguish, by calling it le vrai teint anglais, had all that animation which is more usually found among the natives of the south of Europe. Yet this spirited expression often melted into softness, so insinuating that it was difficult to say whether pensive tenderness or sparkling vivacity was the most predominant, or whether it was the loveliness of her little form and face, or the enchantment of her manners, which made her so very attractive, that the very servants who saw her with Matilda became so fond of her as never to carry her back to the convent, after a visit to their lady, but with reluctance and regret. The nuns, however, with whom she lived, seemed, either from seeing her constantly, or for want of taste, to be quite insensible of perfections which won every other heart. They treated her sometimes with harshness, and always with indifference, so that to be with Miss Willoughby soon became the greatest happiness that little Celestina could enjoy. Mrs. Willoughby found an equal pleasure in returning her affection, and was sometimes moved even to tears when happening to caress Matilda. The other amiable child would approach as if to share her tenderness, take her hand, look innocently in her face, and say with a sigh, Alas, que n'ai-je aussi un madame? These artless expressions, and the coldness with which the sisterhood treated their infant pensioner, raised in Mrs. Willoughby a great desire to know to whom the child belonged. But every attempt to gain information was at first repressed by so much reserve, that she almost despaired of being gratified. At length, however, she received a hint, 
that by the skilful application of means equally potent in courts or convents she might learn all the nuns knew and in consequence of pursuing this hint she was informed that the last superior of the house who had been dead two years had received celestina into it when only a few months old as a child whose birth it was of the utmost consequence to conceal that only the superior herself and her confessor who was also dead had ever known to whom she belonged every trace of which secret had by them been so carefully obliterated that after the decease of both every attempt at discovery had been ineffectual it was believed that a considerable sum of money had been received as the price of secrecy and that as a provision for the child but it had never been carried to account or any part of it appropriated to the use of the community in general who now consequently murmured at the necessity they were under as they said par charity et pour l'amour de dieu to support la petite celestine for life but they added that as soon as she was old enough to take the vows she must become a nun and fill one of the inferior offices of the convent since she had no friends or money to pay for being on a higher footing the piety excited by this account added to the sensibility with which infant as she was she felt her own situation her tender attachment to her benefactress and to matilda the sense of sweetness visible in all she said and did procured for her in the tender and generous heart of mrs willoughby an interest little short of what she felt for matilda herself every hour increased this interest till after a stay of eighteen months at Heary's, during which she had seen her almost every day she found in reflecting on her departure that she should be really unhappy the rest of her life if she returned to england and left this amiable child to a fate of so melancholy in itself and so unworthy of the promise of perfection given her infancy having once entertained the idea of taking her to england it soon became too pleasing to be relinquished there were however great difficulties in the way though the community complained of celestina as a burden to them they made as they declared a point of conscience not to part with her to a heretic and the more solicitous mrs willoughby became the more they declaimed against the sin it would be to hazard the soul of la petite Calestine for the sake of any worldly advantage while the matter was yet in debate george willoughby and mr everard who had been sent for the whole family might return to england together arrived and the latter finding how much mrs willoughby desired to become the sole protectress of the little orphan prevailed with father angelo the present confessor to remove at once all the scruples that had been instrumental in raising in a word mr everard used the argument to which monks in despite of their professions of poverty are not more insensible than the rest of mankind and mrs willoughby having left a certificate of her having taken celestina out of the convent a promise to educate her without influencing her to change her religion and to provide for her together with a direction which she might in case of inquiry be found was permitted to carry with her from Heries the lovely little french girl who was from that hour put on an equal footing with her own daughter and whom she seemed as tenderly to love 
after an absence of between three and four years mrs willoughby and her family returned to england where to all her friends who were generally struck with the beauty and elegance of her adopted child she related without reserve the little history of their accidental attachment george willoughby now in his seventeenth year was sent to cambridge his tutor retiring to a small living which had fallen near his estate in the west of england since his absence and to which his mother as patroness of in his minority had presented this excellent and amiable man mrs willoughby usually passed the winters in london where masters of music drawing dancing and languages attended her two girls for she equally termed matilda and her little friend their summers were divided between public places and alstone or alvinstone as it was spelt an estate between sidmouth and exeter of which her husband had been so fond that he had hurt his fortune by the large sums he had expended on its improvement this attachment george seemed to inherit and in compliment to him his mother always passed the vacations there willoughby himself having no pleasure so great as in talking and thinking of the happiness he should enjoy when he should become master of elstone and see his mother and sister of whom he was extremely fond settled there with him for the greatest part of every year mrs willoughby whose love for him might have been said to border on weakness if it had been possible to discover any excess in the attachment of a mother to a son so uncommonly deserving had always encouraged the inclination he had from his infancy betrayed for this his paternal seat though his little projects often gave her pain for she knew what she had with more tenderness than prudence studiously concealed from him that his father's affairs were at his death so much embarrassed as to render it doubtful whether a minority of near thirteen years would so far clear his estates as to enable him at the end of that period to reside in this favorite place with the splendor and hospitality for which his ancestors had for centuries been eminent the last mr willoughby had indeed continued the same line of conduct in the country but his manner of living in town had been quite unlike that of his prudent and plainer ancestors who had but just recovered his estate when it was transmitted to him from the injuries it had received by their adherence to charles the first during whose unfortunate reign they had sold some part of their extensive possessions and had been plundered of more his grandfather and great-grandfather had nearly retrieved the whole of the estate round alverstone where they piqued themselves on losing none of the family consequence but the manners of the times in which he lived and a disposition extremely gay and volatile had led the last processor into expenses which if they did not oblige him to sell had obliged him to mortgage great part of this as well as all his other estates and being charged at his death with twelve hundred a year to his widow and the interest of ten thousand pounds given to his daughter they slowly and with difficulty produced under the management of very careful executors little more than sufficient to pay such charges and the interest of the money for which they were mortgaged mrs willoughby however was unwilling to interrupt the felicity of her son's happiest hours by representing to him a dreary prospect of the future 
especially as she thought that future might as it advanced become brighter and that it was possible all his gay visions might be realized he had a great uncle far advanced in life and very rich who thought the late mr willoughby had disobliged him might she thought through mere family pride give to the son what he had often declared the father should never possess her brother lord castlenorth was the last male of his illustrious race he had only a daughter and an increase of his family becoming every day more improbable he had concerted with his sister even while george who was younger than his daughter was yet a child how the family might be restored by a union of its two remaining branches the good sense of mrs willoughby had not entirely saved her from family pride and this project which the situation of her son's fortune rendered doubly desirable had by degrees taken such possession of her mind nothing would have made her more unhappy than suspecting it might not take effect after her return with her family from france she had an interview with her brother lord castlenorth who was then in england though his health occasioned him for the most part to reside abroad and it was then agreed with him or rather with lady castlenorth whose will was his law that if the young people liked each other of which they hardly suffered themselves to doubt the match should take place as soon as young willoughby became of age who was then to assume the name of fitzhaman and in whose favour when united with the sole heiress of the family there was little doubt of procuring the succession to the title willoughby who was yet ignorant of this proposed arrangement had accompanied his mother in her visit but far from feeling any partiality for his cousin he had hardly taken any notice of her and had passed all those hours when common civility did not oblige him to attend the family in wandering with his tutor over the extensive domain belonging to his lordship's magnificent seat he seemed indeed much more sensible of the charms of castle north which was the name of his uncle's house from whence the title was derived than pleased with either its present or its future possessor mr everard who anxiously watched every emotion of his mind saw this and he saw too that his pupil was of a temper which would ill bear to be dictated to in a point so nearly connected with his own happiness he prevailed therefore with some difficulty on mrs willoughby not to explain her views till nearer the period when she meant they should be perfected and they left castle north without willoughby's having the smallest suspicion of them or carrying away any other idea of his cousin than that she was tall fat formal brown girl whom he soon forgot and never desired to remember his uncle's complaints and quack medicines his long lectures on genealogy and heraldry had tired him and lady castlenorth's dictatorial manners offended and disgusted him he told mr everard that the only hour in which he had felt any pleasure during his abode at their house was that in which his mother fixed the time of departing for their own thither he returned with redoubted delight after the restraint he had felt himself under at castle north for they lay all his plans of future felicity and there were matilda and celestina his two sisters as he always called them who seemed equally dear to him in a few months he went to cambridge 
and Mr. Everett, who afterwards saw him only for a few days in the year, had no longer the same opportunities of judging of his sentiments. He still, however, had interest enough with Mrs. Willoughby to prevail on her to delay any intimation of the intended alliance. Lord Castlenorth, his lady and daughter, were now in Italy, and were to remain there till within six months of the time fixed among themselves for the marriage of the latter, but above a twelve-month before the arrival of the former period, Mr. Everard died. Mrs. Willoughby and her family lost in him the sincerest friend and most capable monitor, a loss which greatly affected Willoughby, as well as his mother, who sent for her son from Cambridge on that melancholy occasion. Thither he had hardly returned before the uncle of his father, on whom he had great dependence, and who had not long before taken him into his favour and promised to make him his heir, died without having altered his will, and endowed a hospital with the estate which he had really meant to give his nephew, had not death overtaken him before he could conquer his habitual indolence aggravated by the feebleness and imbecility of eighty-seven. This disappointment was severely felt by Mrs. Willoughby, who apprehended that not only the immediate but the contingent interest of her son might be deeply affected by it. She doubted whether it would not change the intentions of her brother in his favour, but after some weeks of uneasy suspense she received assurances from Italy that those his intentions and wishes were still the same. Mrs. Willoughby, though, reassured in this respect, was still in very low spirits, and felt every hour with the increasing severity the loss she had sustained in such a friend as Mr. Everard, whom she lamented indeed publicly but still more bitterly in private. Her constitution, naturally very delicate, began to decline under the sorrow which oppressed her. Matilda, then about sixteen, was the only person about her who seemed insensible of the alteration which now made a slow but very evident progress. In her looks and manner, her countenance was still pleasing and interesting, but very languid. Her eyes had lost their fire, and she grew very thin. Her amiable manners remained, but all her vivacity in conversation was fled. She no longer enjoyed society of which she had been so fond, but she still went into company, because Matilda, now of an age to enter into all the gaieties of high life, did indeed engage in them with an avidity which her mother was too indulgent to repress, though she could not approve it. Sometimes, however, she suffered so much from crowded rooms and late hours that though she did not even then complain, her physicians insisted on her forbearing so continually to hazard her health. Matilda was so very uneasy, if long kept from company, was then put under the care of some of her mother's friends, and the task of attending on her beloved benefactress fell entirely to the lot of Celestina, who was never so happy as when employed in it, and who now, having just completed her fourteenth year, surpassed in the perfections both of person and mind all that Mrs. Willoughby, partial as she had always been to her, had ever supposed she would attain. Above two years passed away, Willoughby pursuing very regularly his studies at Cambridge, Matilda pursuing as regularly every amusement that offered itself, and Celestina, careless of all that has usually attractions for youth, 
devoting her whole time and thoughts to Mrs. Willoughby, who, without saying anything of what she felt to be inevitable, was gradually sinking into the grave. This conviction made her determined to disclose to her son, when she next saw him, her purpose in regard to Miss Fitz Heyman. But it was a resolution she could not bring herself to make, without infinite regret, for in giving her reasons for wishing this alliance, it was necessary for her to open to him the real state of his fortune, of which her tenderness, in this instance perhaps injustice, had hitherto kept him in ignorance. The longer this affectionate mother thought of the pain she should thus inflict on her son, the less she found herself able to undertake it. She therefore determined that Mr. Dawson, who had been employed many years by his father as steward and manager of the estates, should under pretense of consulting him on his affairs, now that he was of an age to direct in them, disclose to him their real situation. For this purpose he went to Cambridge, and there this unpleasant explanation was made to Willoughby, who learned that his father, towards the latter end of his life, had mortgaged above a third of his property for nearly its value that what remained was not only encumbered by heavy debts, which were to be discharged out of it, but had a charge of twelve hundred a year, his mother's jointure, and was to pay his sister ten thousand pounds with interest till she married. Burthens which so diminished the income as to make it impossible to save anything during his minority, and left him no prospect of ever enjoying his paternal estate unembarrassed, but by an opulent marriage. Though Mr. Dawson had, with as much caution and tenderness as possible, opened to Willoughby the real condition of his affairs, the young man, of warm passions and keen feelings, could not hear such a mortifying account, but with the extremest pain and humiliation. Unable to remain tranquilly at Cambridge, he immediately set out for London, and asked of his mother a farther explanation, as if unwilling to receive from any hand but hers a blow so cruel, which seemed to destroy for ever all his favourite hopes. Mrs. Willoughby had ever been so far from suspecting that her son loved money that a tendency to carelessness in that respect had sometimes alarmed her. She was therefore extremely surprised at the eagerness of his inquiries, and the evident anxiety and concern he expressed at his disappointment. But having convinced him that all he had heard was but true, and recovered from the agitation into which the necessity of giving him so much pain had thrown her, she seized the opportunity while his mind seemed to turn with uneasy solicitude towards means of redeeming his patronomy, to suggest to him the plan she had so long considered as infallible. "'My dear George,' said she, there is one way but which all this may be repaired, and your estate, devolving to you from a long line of ancestors of whom any man might be proud, may not only be repaired, but increased by an alliance of which an ambitious man may still be prouder. My brother, Lord Castlenorth, is the last male of a line of distinguished since the conquest your cousin his only daughter will inherit his fortune the titles die with him it is equally natural therefore for him and for me to wish that you my son in becoming the husband of my niece may possess the estates and honours of my family which on such a union would be easily obtained 
and that in you may be revived or rather perpetuated the family of Fitzhaman. I did not intend to have named this to you till your farther acquaintance with your cousin, who returns to England in the course of the next summer, should have made it on your part a measure of inclination, for from all the accounts I have had of her she is very amiable and highly accomplished but my uncertain health and the near approach of that period when you become master of yourself have at length determined me to tell you my thoughts in the matter on which the prosperity of your future life depends i need not say george that seeing it in that light there is nothing in this world so near my heart as its completion willoughby whose mind was contending with the various emotions this discourse of his mother's had raised remained silent and confused he changed colour he sighed as to throw off the unexpected pressure on his heart and mrs willoughby who saw with concern that he entered not into the project with the alacrity she had expected began again to describe to him not only the numerous advantages which must follow the marriage but to repeat all she had heard and more that she had imagined of the perfections of miss fitzhaman willoughby however appeared rather to be musing than attending to almost the only conversation from his mother that he had ever thought tedious when she seemed to have exhausted the subject he still paused a moment then taking his hand from his forehead he asked his mother whether she thought miss fitzhaman as lovely as celestina as lovely as celestina replied mrs willoughby in great and apparent painful surprise how comes celestina to occur to you nay answered her son attempting to appear indifferent i know not how unless because she is the prettiest young woman i have lately seen sure you do not think of celestina reassumed mrs willoughby with increased emotion surely you are not imprudent enough to entertain an idea of her otherwise than as a sister there are objections insuperable objections for god's sake george let me be assured that you will never again think of her dear madam returned willoughby with some quickness that is really more than i can promise how is it possible for me to assure you with any hope of my being able to keep my word that i will not think of a beautiful and interesting object which whenever i am with you is continually before my eyes well then said his mother with yet more chagrin since it is so you will compel me to remove her where surely cried the young man eagerly interrupting her that would be very cruel very cruel as it would affect celestina and very unnecessary as it relates to me for i shall now be very seldom at home and i can without any danger of breaking my word assure you that nothing will ever make your son forget the duty he owes you or hazard giving you pain i am very sorry i named celestina since you seem so easy at it think of it more i beseech you and continue to love as you used to do my adopted sister or i shall never forgive myself for my inadvertence willoughby then without staying to talk over further the proposed alliance with miss fitzhaman hurried away and that he might avoid all farther conversation with his mother he stayed out to supper that night and immediately after breakfast the following morning returned to cambridge telling her as he took leave that it would be time enough to talk over the business 
she had opened to him when the parties to whom it related were in england but that she might assure herself that her happiness was always nearer his heart than his own this was the first time in his life that the parted from matilda and celestina without saluting them both when breakfast was over and he had taken leave of his mother he kissed his sister as usual and was approaching celestina who already held out her hand to him when catching his mother's eye who seemed to look at him reproachingly he blushed and only bowing and wishing celestina her health till he saw her again he hastened to the door and without venturing even to look at her she followed him thither with his mother and sister he mounted his horse and disappeared hurt cruelly at this behavior which from the very different judgment she had formed of it had yet more alarmed his mother celestina could not repress the tears which she felt rising to her eyes mrs willoughby stood at the door till her son turned into another street and was then going to her own room when celestina from an emotion she could not command caught her hand and burst into tears and for the first time in her life her benefactress instead of soothing her received her mournful caresses with repulsive coldness and almost without speaking to her left her matilda was as usual engaged to a morning concert and had neither time nor inclination to attend to the concern of celestina or the displeasure of her mother which indeed she either did not see or seeing reflect upon poor celestina therefore who never suspected the real source of willoughby's affected coldness nor could imagine why his mother who always found pleasure and comfort in her company should now fly from her concluded she had offended them both and passed the morning in tears at dinner however mrs willoughby as if conscious of her injustice behaved to her with even more than her accustomed tenderness after they had dined as matilda was still out their reading went on as usual mrs willoughby took no notice of the swollen eyes and half snuffled snobs which still agitated the general bosom of her young friend but without naming the cause she seemed solicitous to remove every remaining uneasiness and by her easy and affectionate manner celestina became convinced that concern for her son's departure and not anger towards her had occasioned the coldness which had so much alarmed her and her soft heart was thus restored to tranquillity end of volume one chapter one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume one chapter two of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c celestina by charlotte turner smith volume one chapter two though mrs willoughby took infinite pains to appear cheerful and to hide the progress of the illness which was undermining her constitution her efforts to appear better than she was could not deceive her physicians who now proposed that she should go either to lisbon or the south of france this prescription however she endeavoured to evade by assuring them that travelling so late in the year would infallibly injure rather than be useful to her but she promised to follow their advice early in the ensuing spring and to pass the winter at bath 
thither she repaired in november with her daughter and celestina to remain some months willoughby declined joining them at the end of term contrary to his usual custom he informed his mother by letter that he had made a party with some of his friends to pass the christmas vacation at elvenstone and that on their way back to cambridge they would stay two or three days at bath matilda in the meantime who frequented every public amusement was become a bath beauty followed and admired by that description of men whose opinion is considered as decisive in the world of fashion miss willoughby was always most elegantly dressed for to be so was the principal study of her life she was always with people of rank was of an honourable family had a good fortune great connections a pretty person and was to use the common phrase extremely accomplished that is she knew something of everything and talked as if she knew a great deal more among the men of ton who contributed to feed her vanity and raise her fashion was mr molyneux the only son of an irish baronet of whom the bounty of a grandfather had made him independent with a handsome figure a good fortune and a title in reversion mr molyneux was everywhere courted and admired and by lounging about from one public place to another during the summer and passing his winters whether in england or ireland in the very first world he had acquired so high a polish that his manners and his dress his expressions and even his air were copied by all the rising bows his understanding was just of that level which rendered him capable of being pleased with this species of fame and having no great warmth of heart he had no other motive of choice in marrying than that which arose from his solicitude to maintain his importance as a man of taste in the fashionable world he had indeed no great inclination to marry at all but his father now far advanced in life pressed him so earnestly to take a wife and he was so besieged by the kind entreaties of two maiden aunts who had a great deal to give him that tired by their importunity and willing enough to oblige them in a matter which was indifferent to himself he had at length in the thirty-fifth year of his age fixed on miss willoughby as a pretty woman well born and above all very much the rage proposals from such a man were of course accepted by the mother and the daughter willoughby was pleased to hear his sister was likely to be so well established and in a few weeks it was settled that the wedding was to take place in february when mrs willoughby and her family proposed returning to london when willoughby came with his cambridge friends to bath to fulfil the promise given to his mother he was introduced to his future brother-in-law but a very short observation convinced him that they were not designed for friends and that however closely they might be allied mr molyneux would still be to him a mere acquaintance willoughby was eager in the pursuit of knowledge his mind already highly cultivated his heart warm and open and his manners with all the ingenious simplicity of youth had the natural good breeding which only good understanding can give whatever was the real character of molyneux it was no longer distinguishable under the polish of fashion to obtain which alone seemed to be his study all his ideas of good and evil of right or wrong centred there if books had been the object in the circle where he moved he would have qualified himself to talk upon them but as they were not his reading never extended beyond a short novel a pamphlet or a newspaper to strike out something new in a cape or carriage something which the great would imitate 
and the little wonder at was half the purpose of his life to have any affections was reckoned extremely vulgar and as he really had as few as well possible it cost him but a little trouble to divest himself of them entirely and to obtain that sang freud which is the true criterion of a man of fashion it is absolutely necessary to be in the house of commons a seat therefore he had for a cornish borough which he gave a silent vote to the minister for the time being and neither cared nor inquired whether it would benefit or injure his country about which he was perfectly indifferent yet with a mind occupied almost entirely by trifles his handsome figure and his affluent fortune and fashionable manners gave him that consequence which is often denied to virtues and talents his air was that of a man of rank and the calm coldness of his manner gave an idea of latent powers which he was supposed to be too indolent to exert matilda in many respects seemed to be his very counterpart since they had been so much together she had adopted his thoughts and caught his phrases and her brother though he did not think her by any means improved by the imitation allowed that if similarity of character gives happiness in a marriage his sister had a prospect of being completely happy but when he looked at celestina which he avoided doing as much as possible he saw in her improvements so different from those of matilda that all his resolutions to wean his mind from dwelling on her perfections faded before her she was now in her seventeenth year with a face and form which instantly attracted the eye even before the beauties of her understanding had time to display themselves these latter she never obtruded on observation but was as silent in company as matilda was talkative and gay the loveliness of her form therefore it was that immediately struck the young companions of willoughby who both the instant they quitted the room where they had been introduced to mrs willoughby her daughter and celestina asked of willoughby farther particulars of his adopted sister declaring they had never seen so charming a girl and expressing their wonder at the calmness with which she had frequently spoken of her this conversation was so uneasy to him that he could with difficulty conceal his vexation as and as his college friends from time to time renewed it that circumstance added to the pain he felt in forcing himself to behave to celestina with cold and distant civility shortened his visit to three days at the end of which time he took leave of his mother who again mentioned to him her views in regard to miss fitz hymen to which willoughby who was less than ever inclined to listen to her on that point returned vague but gentle answers escaping from it as well as he could without giving anything like a promise he hastened back to his books among which he hoped to lose the idea of celestina which he could not cherish but at the hazard of rendering either his mother or himself unhappy he promised to attend in london his sister's wedding which was now to take place in a month and for what preparations were making but about a week before the day fixed for mrs willoughby's departure for london an inflammation on her already injured lungs seized her so suddenly that there was only time to send an express to cambridge for her son who notwithstanding his utmost expedition arrived hardly an hour before his excellent parent expired as she had before taken leave of her daughter and celestina the greater part of that melancholy hour was given to her son ever the object of her tenderest afflictions
What passed was known only to Willoughby, who, the moment his mother was no more, gave way to such an excess of sorrow as deprived him for some hours of his senses, and when they were restored, the sight of Matilda's calmness, who did not seem to him to feel half the concern she ought to do, and the perfect composure of Molyneux, who evidently felt nothing, seemed to him so insupportable that he shut himself up in his own lodgings, and refused every offer of consolation. Though Celestina had long apprehended that the life of her beloved benefactress was in a much more precarious situation than she could herself allow, or that Matilda was willing to see, yet this cruel and yet unexpected blow quite overwhelmed her. But Willoughby, as unable to bear the sight of her grief as displeased at the stolical composure of his sister, fled with equal solitude from both of them, and having given directions for removing the remains of his mother to the family seat at Elvenstone, he hastened thither himself to receive and pay them the last offices, which being done, he wrote to his sister, recommending it to her to return to London with Celestina, and to send for an elderly maiden relation to remain with them till her marriage, which the death of her mother had of necessity postponed. He promised to see her in town in the course of a fortnight, there to execute, as far as he could, those parts of his mother's will which demanded immediate attention. In pursuance of those directions the young ladies set out for London. Mr. Molyneux followed them in his own carriage. The fight of the house, which had now lost its mistress, threw Celestina into all those agonies which the recollection of past happiness and past kindness from a lamented friend gives to a heart so tender and so sensible as hers, while Matilda, who shed a tear or two from feeling something of the same sensation, presently recovered herself and received her lover, who waited upon her immediately after his arrival, without betraying any symptoms of emotion which could give him cause to apprehend that the repose of his future life might suffer any interruption from the too exquisite sensibility of his wife. At the time he had appointed, Willoughby rejoined them. Though he now saw them with less emotion, his melancholy seemed to be deeper than at first. With his sister he avoided all conversation that was not absolutely necessary. With Celestina he was even more reserved, and never, as in their happier days, brought his books and sat with her, or sought her conversation as his greatest pleasure. He contrived, indeed, under pretense of having affairs to settle abroad, to see her only at dinner or supper, and frequently, under pretense of illness, absented himself from both. After having been with them a few days, during which this reserved and altered behaviour almost broke the heart of Celestina, who seemed to have lost, by the death of the mother, the friendship of the son, he sent up one of the female servants to her room, when she retired thither after breakfast, to beg to speak to her in his sister's dressing-room. This formal message, so unlike the brotherly familiarity with which he used to treat her, cut her to the heart, but she immediately attended the summons. Willoughby bowed on her entrance. They both sat down. Celestina trying to check the tears she found rising to her eyes, and the sighs which swelled her bosom, his looks, so pale, so changed from what they were, his attitude, his silence, all contributed to distress her, while he seemed collecting fortitude to go through the task he was to execute. After a short pause he took from his pocket-book a paper, opened it, 
and counted out three banknotes of six hundred pounds each on the table then advancing towards her with them in his hand he presented them to her saying in a voice which he did not intend should falter there madame is the sum which mrs willoughby which my mother by her will bequeaths to you and which as her executor i most willingly pay you allow me to wish you every happiness and he would have gone on but celestina who had arisen on his approaching her turned pale and sat down you are not well said he the recollection of my mother does indeed overcome me answered celestina i have lost a mother and a brother too yes i have lost all pardon me miss de moray replied willoughby i mean not to distress you and miss de moray repeats repeated celestina again interrupting him miss de moray and madame ah mr willoughby those appellations of distant civility convince me that i have no longer a friend a brother nay but my dear madame be not i beseech you guilty of so much injustice let me execute the directions given me by my dear deceased mother whose orders you know were that within two months of her decease these should be put in your possession he then again offered the notes to her celestina put forth her trembling hand but instantly withdrew it i cannot take the notes indeed mr willoughby said she what can i do with them i who am a minor a stranger an orphan who have no relation no guardian no friend i did indeed hope continued she her eyes filling with tears from the recollection of her forlorn situation i did indeed hope that you sir would have had the goodness to keep it for me till she stopped from inability to proceed till when my dear miss de moray cried willoughby with eagerness he seemed endeavouring to check certainly i would if it had been in my power but it was my solemn promise to my mother to pay it into your hands or into those of any person whom you should appoint cannot i name you as being that person pardon me dear celestina answered willoughby speaking hastily as if fearful of relapsing into the fondness he once felt and desirous of quitting a painful subject pardon me it is not possible for me to be of that service to you which most assuredly i should rejoice to be if dear celestina replied she ah uh, willoughby i have seen for many many months that i am no longer your once dear celestina call me madame and miss dormare as you did just now rather than flatter me with the sound when the sincerity of your regard is gone well sir since for reasons which perhaps i ought not to penetrate it is no longer in your power to act by me as a brother and a friend i will no farther intrude on your kindness than to beg you will tell me how i ought to place the provision thus made for me by my benefactress willoughby half stifled a deep sigh and after a moment's pause said i would advise you to place it immediately on government security in the names of two persons on whom you can rely till you become of age dawson who was you know always employed by my mother is more conversant than i am in these matters if you will give me leave i will send him to you and i am convinced that you may safely trust to, to his honour and probity he then again offered the notes he had in his hand celestina took them in silence being in truth unable to speak and turning hastily away he reached the door where he stopped as if irresolute 
Then, in a low and faltering voice, he said, As I shall probably see you no more, unless in mixed company, before I return to Cambridge, I cannot take this my last leave without assuring you that however circumstances may, alas, must prevent my shrewing it, my heart can never be indifferent to the welfare, to the happiness of my sister Celestina. There was no time for the trembling auditor to answer this address, to reflect on the peculiar way in which the whole was delivered, nor on the strong emphasis laid on the words may and must, for he was in a moment at the bottom of the stairs, and Celestina, who remained in breathless agitation, with the door of the apartment still open, heard him a moment afterwards call to his servant for his hat, and the door of the house presently shut after him. She then sat down and burst into tears, for which she was, on a later reflection, ashamed to assign a reason even to herself. For what do I weep? said she, or why am I disappointed? What did I expect? That Willoughby was attached to me? Surely no, for he never gave me any reason to imagine it, and of late has sedulously avoided me, as if he supposed me weak and vain enough to misinterpret the friendship and regard he used to show me. Let me, while he does not say, convince him that he may, without prejudice to his views in regard to Miss Fitzhaman, still treat me and consider me his sister, and that I never thought of being looked upon otherwise, which surely he must have fancied, or he would not behave to me as he does. Another flood of tears relieved the swelling heart of Celestina after this soliloquy. She then dried her eyes, dressed, and acquired so much command over herself as to meet Willoughby at dinner without betraying any symptoms of the uneasiness and mortification she still suffered, and when the next day he took leave of her and Matilda, she bade him adieu with the same apparent calmness. Three months passed, and the time fixed for Matilda's marriage arrived. Willoughby then wrote to desire his sister would excuse his devoting only a single day to her on that occasion. He would attend, he said, to give her away, but was obliged by indispensable business to return immediately afterwards to Cambridge. Matilda remarked how strange it was that her brother, who had now been some time of age, so bigoted to his books that he could not leave them for longer than a day, even on such an occasion. But his pleasures and hers differed so greatly, and their tempers and pursuits were so opposite, that no sympathy had for some years existed between them though on the part of Willoughby there was always great affection for her, and on hers as much regard for her brother as it was her nature to feel for anybody. This difference of sentiment and inclination, however, had insensibly so far estranged them from each other, that the company of Willoughby was oftener a restraint than a pleasure to his sister, and therefore, as she felt little regret in losing it, she thought not much about his motives for depriving her of it. The evening before that on which Matilda was by special license to be married to Mr. Molyneux, her brother arrived, but instead of the gaiety the occasion required, or even that which had formerly been unusual with him, his melancholy and regret seemed to have been habitual by indulgence. He hardly spoke, and when he did it was with such languor that Matilda might with reason have been alarmed for his health. If she had been capable of attending seriously to anything but herself, Celestina, to whom he behaved with more distant reserve than ever, 
could not be insensible or silent about a health and life which ought she thought to be so precious to his sister and his friends and therefore she spoke to matilda when they retired after supper of the change so evident in her brother matilda answered coldly that she was owing to nothing but his burying himself as he did among his books and losing all relish for other company i wish added she that these fitz hymens were come over that he might live in the world again and be like other people which he must be when he is married celestina could not heartily join in this wish and even doubted whether willoughby ever would be quite like those who were called other people by his sister she dropped the conversation however and retired to her pillow with more solicitude for happiness of matilda which was to be determined the next day that matilda was capable of feeling for herself the image of willoughby such as he was a few years before was strongly painted by her imagination she ran over all their former early pleasures their walks their reading their gardening together at alvastone while yet children then willoughby such as he now was so amiable yet so changed obtruded himself on her mind and being unable to look forward with any degree of pleasure she felt with redoubled sorrow that those days of innocent confidence and ingenious tenderness could never never return end of volume one chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Volume One, Chapter Three of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter Three. When the party met the next day, everybody had left off their mourning, and every face appeared cheerful but those of Willoughby and Celestina. The latter, when gaily rallied by the friends of Mr. Molyneux, endeavoured to recover her tranquillity, and as to Matilda herself, she gave away her hand with as much ease as if it was a matter of course molyneux received it with equal composure and as soon as they were married they sat out accompanied only by celestina and mr hamilton a near relation of the bridegroom for a house which mr molyneux rented in hampshire willoughby saluted his sister and as he handed her into the coach he again wished her happiness it was impossible to avoid doing the same as celestina passed him but he faltered and could hardly articulate his compliment which while he was yet tremendously attempting to express holding one of her hands between his mr hamilton who had been detained by giving some orders to his servant came up and taking her other hand come come as you don't go with us willoughby the care of this lady devolves upon me and i shall not allow these sorrowful partings to make her as melancholy as you are yourself all her journey celestina was then unresistingly led away while willoughby who followed her to the coach door found at that moment his heart assailed by pangs it had never felt before but which he knew too well to be jealousy in its most corrosive form as the coach drove away he stood looking after it now repenting that he had not accompanied his sister and her husband into hampshire 
then determining to order his horse and follow them now detesting hamilton of whom he had never thought before and then resolving to conquer a passion which a thousand circumstances made it the height of folly to indulge the coach which contained the object of it was already out of sight but willoughby still stood on the spot from whence it had been driven so lost in the indulgence of these sensations that he forgot where he was and was roused from his reverie only by the arrival of a friend with whom he had made an appointment to go in his chaise part of the way to cambridge this friend he was ashamed to disappoint nor could he form any excuse to account for his suddenly changing his mind and following his sister whom he had steadily declined to accompany under pretence of urgent engagements while he yet debated the chaise was ready and with a heart torn with contending passions and a mind intent only on celestina and the advantage hamilton enjoyed of being so long with her as during the stay of molyneux in hampshire and in the tour they were afterwards to make he proceeded absent silent and miserable to the end of his journey celestina with equal oppression of spirits was yet more unfortunate because she was afraid of inquiring too narrowly into the source of her concern nor did she dare to indulge it but was compelled to assume cheerfulness very foreign to her feelings mr hamilton who had never taken much notice of her before now seemed disposed to amuse himself by coquetting with her but she had so little inclination to encourage him that as he was too perfectly a man of the world to give himself much trouble about any woman he soon left her to her own amusements in a few days after the bride and bridegroom arrived at their house it was filled with company and matilda wholly occupied with parties all the morning and play in the evening had never time to think of celestina who soon found herself neglected by the only person whom she could now call her friend and the disappointment which still sat so heavy on her heart the failure as she believed of willoughby's regard was now embittered by the coldness or rather carelessness which she experienced from her sister in a few weeks a party was made to visit plymouth and the western bathing places celestina went with them as a matter of course but she felt herself dwindling fast into the humiliating character of a dependent companion and sometimes fancied that her place in the coach might have been occupied by another more to the satisfaction of her friend yet mrs molyneux was never rude to her and sometimes related with apparent kindness how her mother had adopted her from a convent and that therefore she ever should consider her as her sister celestina always felt herself more mortified than gratified by these relations and by degrees they became so irksome to her and the whole style of conversation among matilda's friends so little to her taste that she insensibly acquired an habit of absenting herself and of living very much alone either in her own room or in the walks which whatever the party fixed she contrived to find and whither the image of willoughby such as it had been at a very early period of her life impressed on her young heart incessantly accompanied her this was more particularly the case when in the course of their tour mr and mrs molyneux undertook to show their friends elvestone where willoughby had ordered 
everything to be prepared for their reception as if he had been himself there matilda revisited this beautiful place with no other emotions than those of gratified pride but on celestina it had a very different effect this was the scene where the happiest hours of her life had passed the dressing-room where they all used to assemble when the only parent she had known was its mistress brought her forcibly to the recollection of celestina the chair on which she used to sit the furniture which she had worked herself and the pictures she had collected were so many memorials on which celestina could not look without recollecting a thousand instances of her general goodness or her particular tenderness and feeling with bitter regret the irreparable loss she had sustained the park and the gardens too furnished her with many sources of painful contemplation mingled however with a degree of melancholy so soothing that nothing would have been to her so great a punishment as being obliged to exchange it for the desultory and uninteresting conversation which in the little time spared from the card-table engaged the party within the house the party however troubled themselves very little with her and she was left at liberty to retrace the walks which she had often so traversed with willoughby while matilda leaned on one arm and she on the other and to gaze on the prospects which he while yet a boy had pointed out to them with so much pleasure she remembered all the proposed improvements of which he delighted to talk a rapid stream bursting from the hollow of a rocky common that bounded the park and made its way through it it had been by the former mr willoughby widened at a great expense and now fell several feet into a vale which he had at a still greater cost floated with water on the sides of this fall which had been formerly part of the common grew some old oaks and a beech and among these the mountain ash and weeping birch had been planted and now spread their various foliage and half concealed the water that dashed from rock to rock between them these steep banks had ever been the favorite seats of willoughby who was sitting there between his two sisters and holding each of their hands had very frequently amused himself with projects to increase the roar of the water or deepen the shape of the wood that fringed its side this place was the daily resort of celestina during the week she remained at alvinstone and thither she usually carried some of those books from the library that she remembered willoughby had read to her these were principally poetry and the reprusal of them the place the season a thousand tender remembrances enforced by each served at once to soften and depress a heart naturally tender and affectionate which deprived of almost every other object of its regard cherished with painful pleasure the idea of willoughby such as he once was and when they passed here so many innocent enchanting hours but when she imagined that in a few months he would probably revisit these scenes with another with miss fitz Heyman, who would then be his wife and that she herself should never again be admitted to wander among them with their beloved master sick despondence took possession of her soul and it was with difficulty after these reflections that she could reassume courage enough to mix with the friends whom mr and mr molyneux had assembled to listen to insipid pleasantry and attend to uninteresting conversation but whatever regret celestina felt in recollecting past hours of felicity 
which she knew could never return, she left Alvanston with extreme reluctance, and had it been proper or possible would most willingly have remained there alone. In quitting it never to return, she felt almost as much concern as she had done when in taking leave of Willoughby she fancied that she should see him no more till he was married to Miss Fitzhaman. Of that match Miss Molyneux now very frequently spoke as a matter entirely settled, and Celestina no longer doubted of its speedy completion. This circumstance, which gave her uneasiness that she was unable either to repress or entirely to disguise, the increasing indifference of Matilda towards her, and the constant succession of company in which Mr. and Mrs. Molyneux lived, united to raise in her a wish to quit them, and finding that the hints she gave of such a disposition were received with perfect carelessness, and that such a removal would probably not be objected to, she every day grew fonder of her project, and during their stay at Sidmouth fixed on a cottage about four miles from it, where she thought she might reside, if not happily at least in that quiet obscurity which her circumstances rendered prudent, and her distaste to the world in which she now lived pleasant. She found that she could there be accommodated with board and lodging, and there she would have remained if Mrs. Molyneux had not, when she understood her project, insisted on her returning to London with her after finishing their tour. "'Go with me, however,' said she, "'the rest of our journey until we meet the Castle Norse, who are to be in town in October.' and then if you have this rural passion still so strong upon you you shall take your own way though there was little appearance of affection in this invitation celestina thought she ought not to decline it and therefore though meeting the castle norse was what she most solicitously wished to avoid she determined to go with her friend to town, that she might not give her any pretense for forgetting her entirely, or incur the censure of the world for leaving abruptly the only protection she could claim. End of Volume 1 Chapter 3 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 1, Chapter 4 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 1, Chapter 4. The return of Mr. and Mrs. Molyneux to London was postponed from time to time till November. Lord Castlenorth had been too ill to set out on his journey to England at the time he proposed, and the family meeting which was to settle all that related to the marriage was now delayed till after Christmas. Willoughby, however, testified no impatience. He had promised to meet his sister and her husband in town on their arrival, but instead of doing so he sent such an insufficient excuse as must have appeared very strange to Matilda, had she thought much about it, but immersed in pleasures and pursuits of her own she gave herself very little time to reflect on her brother's conduct and was far from supposing that he absented himself because he could not see celestina without increasing and confirming a passion which he had many reasons against indulging 
and of which he was determined to cure himself by absence and reflection the negotiation with his uncle which had been carried so far by his mother he neither declined nor forwarded but suffered it to remain nearly on the footing she had left it flattering himself that by the time miss fitz Heyman arrived in london he should have so far conquered his early attachment as to have an heart as well the hand which he had promised to his mother's entreaties to offer her though his endeavors to forget celestina had hitherto been quite unsuccessful he had however acquired so much resolution as to determine not to see her till the arrival of his destined wife and the final settlement of everything that related to his marriage should put it out of his power to break the engagement he had made to mrs willoughby in her last hours and to sacrifice everything to his passion the struggle he underwent however was dreadful and by continually repeating to himself the necessity there was for his forgetting celestina he so accustomed himself to think of her that he in reality soon ceased to think with interest of anybody else and though he endeavoured to persuade himself that he should have courage to acquit himself of what he tried to think his duty to his family to his mother's memory and himself there was no intelligence he so much dreaded as that of the arrival of his uncle's family in england celestina on her part passed her time in a way very unpleasant to her mrs molyneux now mistress of herself plunged into unceasing dissipation and as celestina was frequently desired to accompany her and always to make one of the parties she collected at her own house she found that the expenses of dress alone would greatly exceed the income of her little fortune and that she should soon exhaust it to live among people whose society gave her no pleasure and who for the most part considered her only as she was capable of filling up a table or the corner of a couch when it was vacant her quickness of apprehension and extreme sensibility made her too frequently remark that the table or the couch might in the apprehension of matilda always be as well and sometimes better filled and these observations together with her growing dislike to mr molyneux and the people with whom he associated who not unfrequently treated her with the pertinent familiarity which they thought themselves at liberty to use towards mrs molyneux's companion renewed before she had been six weeks in town her wish to quit them for ever and to enjoy in her own way the small independence given her by her lamented benefactress the certainty that miss fitz Heyman was so soon to become the wife of the only man for whom she ever had felt the least degree of partiality hastened the execution of her project she now heard every day of the great beauty the extraordinary accomplishments and the immense fortune of the future bride while mrs molyneux was exercising her fancy on the equipages and other preparations which were soon to be on foot for the wedding of her brother a subject that celestina always listened to with impatience which though she with difficulty concealed it from others she was painfully conscious of herself the eternal harangues of mrs molyneux on taste and elegance had always been fatiguing to her but she was more than usually disgusted when the purpose of those lectures was to decide upon 
or to describe the bridal fineries intended for willoughby and miss fitz hangman a letter now arrived from lady castlenorth announcing her intentions of being in london with her lord and her daughter the following week and at this intelligence celestina no longer hesitating wrote to the person near sidmouth to whom she had spoken the preceding summer and finding she could be immediately received at the lodging she had then looked at she packed up and sent by the wagon the small collection of books given her by mrs willoughby which with her clothes and the legacy vested in the funds were all her worldly possessions and that evening after supper when by a chance very unusual with them mr and mrs molyneux were without company she declared her intentions of going into the country the next day mr molyneux twirling about a wine-glass and humming a tune seemed to attend very little to the information his wife after hearing it with almost equal indifference said i cannot imagine my dear why you think of going into the country now or what you propose by it nothing more replied celestina piqued at the coldness of her manner than to accustom myself at once to a mode of life which my narrow fortune renders if not absolutely necessary at least highly prudent prudence cried molyneux with a smile which celestina thought a contemptuous one is an acquisition very unusual at eighteen but a girl of spirit with so pretty a person as yours should be rather ambitious than prudent and should try to make her fortune by marriage instead of hiding herself in the country numberless young women about town have done extremely well who without any compliment have not had your share of beauty very possibly sir replied celestina but unless my mind was disposed as their minds probably were which i believe it never will be the personal advantages you so flatteringly allow me will never obtain the affluence you think so desirable what do you mean to say answered he what do you pretend that you would not marry as other women do for money or title for neither upon my honour pooh i thought you had more sense but since it's so my dear celestina i wish you all the possible felicity in your new plan of pastoral amusement and doubt not but that some tender and amiable philander in the shape of a young west country curate will enable you to realize to your heart's content all your ideas of disinterested love and rural happiness molyneux then sauntered away and his lady looking in a pocket mirror and picking her teeth with the nicest care took up the argument you know celestina that i have the greatest regard in the world for you and that i have argued with you for ever about this nonsensical resolution which i cannot imagine what put into your head you will be tired to death child in the country at this time of year however if you will go do stay here at least till after my brother is married we shall have half the world with us then and i shall want you for twenty things at the mention of willoughby's marriage celestina though so much accustomed to hear it changed colour and her voice as well as her look might have betrayed the uneasy sensations she felt if mrs molyneux had not been always too much occupied by herself to attend very narrowly to another pardon me dear madam said celestina i certainly cannot be wanted on that occasion you will have so many other friends about you that i shall not be missed and i have no right indeed i never had any 
to be upon an equality with the persons who will then be assembled about you let me therefore find my own place in society and learn at once to submit to it after some other conversation celestina still unwilling to appear in the slightest degree ungrateful for past kindness or too impatient of her present situation agreed to stay another week in town and retire to her own room relieved by having thus declared her intentions and fixed the time when her present uneasy stay of dependence would be at an end by this delay she repented when the next day notice was received by mrs molyneux of the arrival of lord and lady castlenorth at their house in grosvenor street mr and mrs molyneux instantly waited on them the next evening they were to return the visit in form and thus celestina was compelled to be present at a meeting she had been studiously endeavouring to avoid lord castlenorth was one of those unfortunate beings who had been brought up never to have a wish unprevented or a want ungratified he was born when his father was far advanced in life the sole heir to one of the most ancient families and opulent fortunes in england and was of so much consequence that till he was near eighteen he was hardly ever suffered out of the sight of his father he was then released by death from the officious affliction which had long been very troublesome to him and with everything on his side but a good constitution he sat out on a wild career of pleasure in which before he had materially hurt his fortune he was stopped by the apprehension of declining health his figure was one of those which looked as if the blasts of january would blow them through and through and the irregularities of his life had so much impaired a habit naturally weak that at thirty he was a mere shadow and then was told by his physicians that he must resolve on a residence of some time in the south of europe if he would avoid going to that country from whose bourne no traveller returns to which having a invincible aversion he lost not a moment in complying with their advice but as he soon recovered some degree of health he grew every day less attentive to injunctions they had given as to his manner of life and relapsing into his former indiscretions he was again reduced to extremities and when very little hope of his life remained was recommended by one of his medical friends in london to put himself under the care of dr maclaurin a scottish physician who had been settled for two or three years at naples with his wife and family there he was treated with the most assiduous attention not only by the doctor himself but by mrs maclaurin and her daughter then near thirty who was so reasonable as to allow herself to be five-and-twenty she was tall and had a tolerable face with which her ambition to be admired suffered her not to be content in its natural state she had been brought up to attend most sedulously to her own interest and pursue the establishment of her fortune by marriage she had therefore learned early to fawn and flatter and to the cunning of her mother united some portion of her abilities of her father mrs maclaurin was one of the that species of beings who are by courtesy denominated good sort of woman all her virtues were negative and of the few vices she had it in her power to practise she contented herself with malice and defamation and even in those she never indulged herself unless very certain 
that the objects were incapable of retort and totally defenseless. She had now, however, but little opportunity of gratification, for though she had lived three years in Italy, she understood not a word of the language, and her attempts to amend the world being therefore made in one not understood by those in whose favour they were exerted, were very little comprehended, and of course failed of affording her much satisfaction, her talents being thus perforce confined to her own household, it had taken another turn, and had been applied to the acquisition of money, and of securing a good match for her daughter. The doctor, though really a man of some abilities, had not hitherto been successful enough in his profession to be enabled to give her a fortune. The project of marrying her well was equally interesting to him, and among the various patients he had received into his house since he resided at Naples, the elder son of a very opulent merchant in London, and an old baronet, who had several daughters older than Miss Maclaurin, very narrowly escaped her multiform attractions by the impertinent remonstrances of their families. Lord Castlenorth had no relations but Miss Willoughby, who was very unlikely to interfere in any matrimonial project. He had besides a much larger fortune, and was a much higher rank than any of those for whom the family of Maclaurin had intended the honour of their alliance. But the very circumstances which rendered the prospect of such a marriage most alluring seemed to preclude the probability of success. Among the few things Lord Castlenorth had learned of his father, the principal was to value himself on his descent, and, as far as related to his own family, he was a genealogist almost as soon as he could speak. As he advanced in life, he found himself of so little consequence for in individual merit that he was compelled to avail himself of the names of his ancestors, from whom only he derived any importance at all, and the punny insect shivering at a breeze swelled with conscious pride when he recited the names of heroes from whom he had so woefully degenerated. This pride of ancestry was now the most distinguishing feature in a character where it appeared with the greatest prominence from the faintness and insipidity of the other traits, for being no longer able to pursue the dissolute manner of life which he had adopted rather from fashion than inclination. He had now, in other respects, no character at all. Miss Maclaurin, who began to study him as soon as he was received by her father, soon saw it, and saw it with dismay for she supposed that it would be an insuperable bar to those hopes, which she thought she might otherwise very reasonably entertain. The doctor, however, had too many resources to be so easily discouraged. He fabricated with admirable in ingenuity a story of which he justly supposed the ignorance and indolence of his patient would prevent his ever detecting the falsehood. He said that he was really a Hamilton, and he had taken his present name in compliance with the whim of a distant relation, who had on that condition given him his property. The only objection being thus removed, Mrs. Maclaurin had a fair field for her attractive talents, and they were so effectually exerted that in about five months after Lord Castlenorth's reception into the family of Maclaren, he became himself a member of it, and Miss Maclaren returned to England as his wife. 
that her father might still retain without too scrupulous an inquiry his relationship to the house of hamilton and that her mother's coarse figure and coarser manners might be no disgrace to lady castlenorth in the sphere which she now prepared to blaze she prevailed upon them to retire to their native country on a pension which there gave them consequence while her ladyship who while she was miss maclaurin had nothing doubted of her own eminent perfections was now so convinced of their irresistible power by having thus established her in a situation so much above her hopes that she thought herself born for the government and amendment of the world and from that period had been advancing in arrogance and ostentation till the present hour when at the age of fifty with an unwieldy person and a broad face where high cheekbones appeared emulous of giving some protection to two grey prominent eyes whose lids seemed inadequate to shade them lady castlenorth was as well as her rank and her talents and her travels qualified in her own opinion for universal dominion no content therefore with governing her lord with despotic sway which indeed saved him the trouble and probably the disgrace of governing himself she assumed towards the rest of the world a style equally dictatorial her opinion was strongly enforced on every topic that came before her in private anecdote in public debates in literature in politics in fashions she was equally omniscient and whether the conversation ran on taxes or on taste in laying out grounds or on setting out a dinner in making a piece or poem she understood all descanted on all and could decide on all in a way from which few of her auditors had at the moment courage to appeal by the side of this majestic figure her lord the descendant of the old earls of gloucester of welsh princes and english kings sunk into insignificance his diminutive figure now shrunk by age and sickness his sallow and withered countenance and his feeble step formed a decided contrast to his robust and juno-like lady by whom he suffered himself to be led about without ever pretending to distant from her opinion unless in matters of heraldry or genealogy where he still ventured to take the lead in which she was for the most part willing to indulge him his lordship's ill health had made him also conversant in physic a science in which notwithstanding her hereditary claim to it lady castlenorth had not shrewd much disposition to contend with him but as there was more trouble and disgust than honour to be obtained by a constant attention to it as applied to his real or imaginary complaints she had very frequently delegated her authority and at length quite relinquished her knowledge to a relation who being a widow and said to possess a pretty fortune though nobody ever knew where it lay now about six and forty had with infinite philanthropy dedicated her days to relieve the infirmities of her fellow creatures without any other advantage than that of being received in turn at their houses she knew every receipt whether of diet or medicine that could be named as preventative or cure understood the preparation of every quack remedy and the qualities of all the drugs of which they are compounded nor was she less acquainted with the human frame and would in all companies give the history of any complaint 
to which it is subject in technical terms to the wonder of some and the terror of many hearers such were the manners of mrs calder and her person was one of those which but for their singularity nobody would ever recollect as having seen at all she now resided constantly with lord and lady castlenorth to both of whom she had contrived to render herself necessary with them she had been abroad where she had greatly improved her stock of knowledge and had actually written a treatise on the goiters of the alpine peasants which lady castlenorth was polishing for publication and she was now of the party who were assembled at mrs molyneux's where the last but not the least in consequence appeared also the destined bride of willoughby the claim of this young lady to eminent beauty or to anything more than a barely tolerable person would certainly not have been allowed had she not been heiress to the illustrious house of fitzhaman but the eustion of pretence which she had a right to seemed to give her a pretence also to much of what nature had very scantily allowed her she was as tall and almost as large as her mother whom she greatly resembled her complexion was brown and as her hair was not dark the want of contrast produced a muddy and heavy effect which nothing could have relieved but two dark eyes whose powers were assisted by a greater quantity of rouge than unmarried ladies are even by the french customs usually allowed what expression they naturally had however was not pleasing and what they borrowed from the addition added more to their fierceness than their lustre they were eyes of high claims and expectations which demanded rather than solicited admiration and signified pretty plainly the real disposition of a character inflated with ideas of its own consequence and considering more than half the world as beings of another species whose evils she could not feel for because she was placed where it was impossible she could ever share them to the personal arrogance of her mother she added the hereditary pride of her father the first had taught her that hardly any man could deserve so perfect and accomplished a creature the second that it was more desirable to unite herself with willoughby and thus continue her own illustrious race than lose or share her consequence by marrying a nobleman of superior rank some degree of personal partiality too contributed to render this resolution more pleasing to her for though she had not seen her cousin for between three and four years his graceful and beautiful form when he left eton with his dark auburn hair flowing over his shoulders had made a very lasting impression in his favour end of volume one chapter four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c